I've been teaching English. Uh, teaching English as a second language in Asia has never been my main job, has never been my main passion. It's not what I studied in university, uh, but it is something I've done in between other jobs, and it's something that I've done so that I could study languages, history, politics, etc. in several different countries here in Asia. Currently, I'm living in China, but I'm right on the edge of Southeast Asia, fascinating part of Yunnan, right by the border with Myanmar, working primarily with university students, also have experience with kids, basically all age levels. I have experience teaching adults in the workplace too. Blah, blah, blah. What do I have to say in this video? What strikes me now in getting back into teaching English after several years, pause of several years in which I haven't taught English as a second language at all, but during those years I have given lectures in university settings, in academic settings, in conferences, and given lectures to university students in different situations. Um, and I've been lecturing here on YouTube in a sense. You know, I, I'd say the most striking thing to me, getting back into it after several years, is the difference in your perception of time. I think one of the skills you really need is to perceive time in a very different way. Whether you're teaching in 40-minute segments or one-hour blocks, whatever the setup is, where you really feel the passage of time while you're being engaged with the students, while you're writing on the chalkboard, where you're aware of how time is passing, both to use it efficiently and, in a, fence, in a sense, you know, work the crowd, keep the engagement with the audience going. And, you know, it is one of the real differences between people. Some people can do that naturally. Some people can do it as a learned behavior. And some people never can learn it. You know, I think some people can never quite pick up the knack of having a sense of how time passes moment to moment that way. So that really struck me just now getting back into the classroom after so many years. I was like, oh, yeah, I have to fit back into this very different way of perceiving time. And every moment counts. You know, when I was a student learning German in Germany, when I was paying to take language classes in Germany, um, I remember another student complained to me that one of the teachers who had just come back after many years in administration, so he had lost the knack, that he would simply stand there thinking for a few moments at a time, but in between shifting between topics, shifting between different rules of grammar, who was trying to explain whatever it was. But she said that alone made it absolutely intolerable. And she said you could sit there with a stopwatch and time how many minutes he was wasting. So, you know, you have to be engaging the students constantly. You have to be aware of how time is passing. You have to be using their time in a way that's meaningful. And, of course, you know, when you're coming up to the last 10 minutes, you got to wrap up the topic or you got to wrap up the lesson. you got to deliver that uh, in a way that's meaningful. Now, with the university students, you know, I do explain my methodology, so to speak. So, I just got a comment in the live chat saying it's an art for sure. I don't know, man. Like, you know, it di <laughs> different strokes for different folks. Different people have different natural strengths. For me, I do have a kind of natural theatricality that I exploit in YouTube videos. Uh, back when I was a religious figure, I used to be a Buddhist. I could stand up in a room full of Buddhist monks and give a lecture on philosophy with no script. You know, I, I talk a good game, and I've been like that for my whole adult life. You know, not at age 14, obviously. Uh, to some extent, it's nurture. To some extent, it's nature. To some extent, it's, it's hard experience. But, you know, um, it's not an art. I mean, it's fine. It's a totally good comment. It's an art for sure. It's real. I mean, it's not an art. It's education, right? <laughs> Teaching is not stand-up comedy. And, I mean, what you're always leaning on, and you see the limits of it, is simply the sincere interest of your students. In every classroom you walk into, if you've got 40 students, you're going to feel right away which students are really motivated to learn and which ones aren't. And you're never going to change that. There's an old phrase in Latin, uh, villa non discutur. I can teach you English, but I can't teach you to want to learn English. I can't teach you to want it. The will, the wanting. That's the part I can't, I can't teach you, you know? So you come into a room and you have 40 students and they're all at different levels of ability. They're all at different levels of inspiration or different levels of motivation when they come into the room. And when they leave the room, they're going to be even more unequal. Education does not create equality. It exacerbates inequality. The most talented students are going to advance more or the most highly motivated students, whatever it may be. 
and others are just going to get further and further behind. And you get to see that happen. You don't just see that happen over months or years. You can see it in one day. You can see it in one two-hour university lecture. I can see the students that are making progress in the two hours and the students who aren't. I'm not perfect, but I'm just saying you do see striking examples of that even within uh, your, your first class. You know, I said to my students at the university level uh, this year, I said to them openly, I said this actually in both English and in Chinese, and I'll, I'll come back to that issue. Um, some of you will just want to find a job in a hotel, and that's fine. If you want to work in a hotel, you use just a few words of English again and again. Your English doesn't have to be terribly advanced, doesn't have to be terribly in-depth. Every day at the hotel, people ask you, where's the bathroom? People say to you, I need a taxi. There are just a few questions you get every day at the hotel in English again and again, and that's it. That's fine. I said, but some of you want to become school teachers. Now, actually, the, the vast majority of my students want to become school teachers. That's the particular program they're enrolled in. And some of you want to become translators. And some of you want to fly to America and get a job in America. If you want to do that, then suddenly the level of effort expected of you is way higher. Um, your level of commitment, the amount of work you have to put in this class is much, much more. And I said to them, you know, uh, if you're not motivated to do that, that's okay. I am not going to be angry at you. I'm not going to punish you. It's your choice. I respect your choice. I respect your decision to work hard, to try to reach the level, or to not work hard. You can still learn from this class. You can still benefit from this class, relaxing and taking it easy. Not everyone is going to become a professional translator. Not everyone is going to become you know, an English teacher themselves or fly to America. I, I really do appreciate that. Many of you are going to choose career paths where you never use English again, right? So I, I set out the, the methodology for the course, and I really let them know this is the behavior I accept positively. I accept that there's a, you know, there's a range for the students. In effect, what I'm saying, this is not how I said but what I'm, what I'm saying in effect is I accept that some of you want to sit at the back of the class and not work that hard, and some of you want to sit at the front of the class and devote your full attention. I respect that. And I told them what I don't respect. I don't respect you playing video games in class. I don't respect you sending text messages in class. I don't respect you using a phone or computer at all. And I said, if you want to do that, don't come to class. If you're sick or tired, you have a cold, you broke up with your boyfriend, you're sad, okay, don't come. But if you come here, and they all found it cute, not a single one of my students this year was offended, not a single one was angry or defensive, I got out this, uh, this great prop I have, and it's, uh, I tell them it's a cell phone prison. It's this sort of unique device. I said, if you use your cell phone in class, you know, I'm going to take your cell phone away from you, and I'm going to put it in the pockets of this cell phone prison. You, know, you, get, you get your phone back at the end of class, you only, you know, so you, only, you can't use your cell phone for the next 45 minutes or something. It's not that big a deal. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm going to take your cell phones away from you. So again, this is how I start at the university level. This advice is only going to be useful for a, for a very small number of you. I'm just telling you, just telling you how I roll. Um, the job is only rewarding if you are yourself learning the student's first language. I've got to say that's crucial. When I was in Cambodia, I spoke Cambodian very poorly. But even if you're just using little phrases, if you're just using the word noun, verb, adjective in Cambodian, in their, their first language, in the student's first language, then you're, you're practicing that every day. Even if you're just using, even if you're just telling them, no, no, say it to me in a complete sentence. No, no, say it to me in English. You're saying that in Cambodian, you know, or Thai or Laotian or Chinese. You know, even if it's just the, the clarification phrases and this kind of thing, that you're, you're using their, their language for, that adds up to a lot of hours of practicing the target language. And actually, when I'm teaching English, I use a lot of Chinese now, currently living in China. When I lived in Laos, I used a lot of Laotian when I was, when I was teaching English too. Um, so that is inherently very rewarding. And I can't understand the guys who do this job without learning or studying the host language. People say host language and target language. 
if if you don't, it it really I think it really just takes the soul out of the job. You know what I mean? And um, again, I think that's you know maybe it's a matter of character or what have you. There are a lot of suspicious things about the people who choose to become English teachers in Asia. Every other category of the education industry is dominated by females, right? And yet, mysteriously, here in China, the vast majority of the English teachers are male. Why is that? Is it just that women are risk-averse, that they're afraid to come out and live here in the rough hinterlands of China? I doubt it. I think a lot of the men, because I've met them, talked to them, I've looked in their eyes, a lot of them are here for bad reasons. And I don't mean money. Uh, you know, alcohol, sex, maybe gambling, maybe prostitution. Um, sadly, you know, the, again, almost nobody's motivated by money because the money isn't enough to motivate you. It's just not. I mean, you're better off working in a donut store, better off working in Starbucks or McDonald's back in Canada, the United States. Doesn't make sense to do it for the money, right? Um, so if you are not motivated by something like the study of language, history, politics, something, if you are not yourself a student as well as being a teacher, then it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely not worth doing. I don't know. Um, I mean, again, so many of these things come down to irreducible elements of personality. So I've had the experience over the years, you know, where you, you really don't have enough time for class prep, where for some, for some reason that day you're busy or you're sick, you've got to drive your girlfriend to the hospital or something, you know, something happens where you really don't have time to prep. And then you go in and you do your class with only 15 minutes of prep or something. And, you know, for me, I've never had the experience of wishing that I'd done more prep. You know what I mean? Sometimes, though, for me, this is just for my personality type, those experiences are more thrilling okay, I got to improv. Like, okay, I just got 15 minutes to think. What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about crocodiles. I'm going to talk about how in Florida, it's dangerous to go swimming with crocodiles. You know that? Sorry, I just made that, that up now. That could be a great lesson. Let's engage the whole class. What do you do? Let's have, a, let's have a bunch of discussions in English. Let's do an essay assignment. What do you do if you're attacked by a crocodile? You know, <laughs> you could come up with, with something random. It's, it's really strange. Like the less preparation you do, for me, for my personality type, the more rewarding the job feels. But I mean, like right now, I do improvised lectures on YouTube all the time. That's, that's my personality type. And if you do more preparation, it's definitely true. I mean, I think if you over-prepare, then you can set yourself up for disappointment when the students don't get it, when they don't react well, when they're not interested. Uh, and then how are you going to feel? If you put three hours into preparing a one-hour lesson, and the students, they're just, for whatever reason, ignorance, indolence, for whatever reason, they're not following, they're not interested. What then, right? Now, of course, some people, their solution is to pre spend six hours preparing multiple lessons. So if the students don't like it during the lesson, they can switch. If the students don't, the students can't do it. It's not even about not, maybe they're just not capable of, uh, of, of participating in your lesson as you, uh, as you set it out. Um... But, you know, again, so, so speaking about both the university level and, and children or younger than university level, I mean, I think the greatest gift your employer can give you is accurate information on the student's interests, right? So I was invited to take a job, which I'm not going to take. One of you guys can take the job, by the way, if, if any of you guys want to move here. that would be. I should recruit. I should start recruiting employees via my Patreon subscribers. That'd be great. Start interviewing you guys. See if you want to want to move in next door to me here, work in my town in China. But you know they they invited me to take up a job just teaching medical students. Now the job was very very hard. University level students studying medicine. So some to become doctors, some to become nurses, some for other specialized professions within hospitals. Right. But you know, then there are many, many ways in which that job was hard. I think they wanted me to teach 18 classes a week. So 18 university lectures a week, right? Tough. But the gift they give you is that they tell you what the students are interested in. They tell you that they're all medical students. So already, for me, the curriculum writes itself. 
I can sit down, no internet access, no no books, no textbooks. I don't need the textbooks. If I know that these 40 students in the classroom, that every single one of them has to deal with Latin vocabulary in English, pharmacopoeia, um, names of technical tools and instruments in the hospital, what's the difference between a scalpel and a suture, you know, stitches, I mean, <laughs> words about hygiene, um, plastic gloves, uh, even the fact that they're, they're in a hospital setting, I could use, you know, um, some crappy soap operas set in a hospital. I could play video clips from soap operas or movies. There's so many American movies that are set in a hospital. Already, just that one word, hospital. All of these, all of these, um, all these students having that much in common. That's already such a gift for an educator, right? Now, that's some of you might think, okay, well, that's the hardest kind of job, um, teaching university level. And those would be students, by the way, who are not interested in learning English. Those would be Chinese students where their real interest is in becoming a medical doctor and they're being forced to learn English as a job requirement. So that, that would be tough. That's not like getting a bunch of students who really want to become English lit majors or want to become translators. They would not be motivated in the way other students would. But the hardest thing is, of course, by contrast, if you're really talking about children, children at any age, like 13-year-old children, what are their interests? What do they have in common? It's not like they're going to be all committed to learning medicine, right? It's not even that they'll be interested in English, sadly. They may be there because their parents forced them to be. So that's tough. To be honest with you, I mean, in many, many ways, teaching children is easier than teaching adults or is easier than teaching university students. But the greatest gift your employer can give you is accurate information about your students' motivations. And almost by definition, with children, you could never know that.